Hello and welcome everyone to today's workshop on the European Research Council Scholarship Grant. Um, just before we begin, I want to let you all know, just like our other uh, public workshops, this is um, also being recorded. So keep your videos on if you are comfortable being uh, in the recording um, of this session. But if you're not, then keep your videos off. And uh, when we move to the Q&A section, if you are comfortable being in the recording, then you can raise your hand, unmute and ask the question. Or if you, you can just put all your questions in chat. Um, I'd also request everyone to keep themselves on mute during the presentation and then um, uh, unmute only when asked to, uh, when you raise your hand. Okay, so as I said, uh, today's workshop is on the European Research Council scholarship and so, sort of grant. Um, so I'll begin by uh, talking about Project EDU Access and introducing you to the uh, panelists. And then uh, I'll hand it over to the two panelists who will give you an overview of the scholarship they'll give you uh what they tell you a little bit about the eligibility criteria what are the application documents that you require uh what does the timeline look like what is the selection process and give you some general tips about um um your application and, and sort of how to apply and, and what to think of when you are applying for the scholarship so for those of you who are uh joining us for the first time. Um, we are Project EDU Access. Um, we recognize and realize that access to higher education, leadership, and um, professional opportunities is a privilege that most people from marginalized communities are systematically denied through cost, information, and dispositional barriers. And we try to make all of these opportunities a little more accessible. We do this through a number of ways. Uh, we run a graduate mentorship program. We engage in advocacy and we also do a lot of capacity building workshops and sessions in person and online and today's <clears throat> online workshop is sort of part of that modest attempt. So we have two very wonderful people who have joined us today to host the workshop. We have with us Rashmi Guhare, who's doing her PhD in geography from University College Dublin in Ireland and is a European Research Council scholar for 2023. We also have with us Akil Ahmad, who's doing a PhD in microbiology and biotechnology from the University of Helsinki in Finland and also received the European Research Council scholarship or grant in 2023. Um, thank you so much to the two of you for being here and for taking the time out on a Saturday morning to speak to our uh, wonderful audience. Um, I'll hand it over to you now, uh, Rashmi. <clears throat> okay, so, you know, thank you, Ms. Ba, for such a kind introduction and thank you, Akhil, for doing this with me. So, like, I'm very pleased to be doing this and this is one of the first times I'm doing this. So, I'll begin by talking a bit about the, you know, what is the ERC grant? Because, you know, a lot of people are not familiar with what entails ERC. The ERC is, you know... Uh, part of the European Union and uh, grant and it was set up in 2007. So it, it, its mission is to encourage highest quality research across Europe and support to organize, you know, students and scholars from across the globe access that scholarship. And uh, it funds research across field. And uh, over time, it, it has initially it was initially supported by the stem fields you know like in science and technology and that's where the bulk of its funding goes but these days humanities and life sciences are getting very interesting projects you know supported by the erc it is an independent scientific council and you know it also focuses on you know it is supported by horizon europe so it is something i've been talking about a lot it's a um, a group collaborative project and it has um, a lot of people coming in and working together from across the globe and so that's your scene in a nutshell so okay so, I'll pass on to Akhil because STEM is his field yeah so I would like to take an opportunity first thank you Ms. for that kind words and uh, thank you Rishmi uh, for doing this with me so uh, I'm here to like let you know about the what's the eligibility criteria, eligibility criteria for the umbrella term STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So it basically varies according to the program. So basically the eligibility criteria, it depends on the projects that you are applying to. 
So you will need to have to like look at the uh, advertisement, look at the website of the project that what the project is demanding. So as you will all know that for any application process, for any PhD application process, you will need you will need a couple of like things to uh, to be eligible for that uh, PhD position. Like first and the foremost, the important one is the academic qualifications. Now, as for the PhD is concerned, that you must hold a master's two year master's degree, or you must hold an equivalent qualification for the particular PhD position, whether like it's in any umbrella term, science, technology, and engineering, or mathematics. So the master's degree is master here. So second thing is you need to have a research experience and or expertise in the relevant field or uh, of the application. So here I'll give you uh, I'll give you an example. For example, uh, if like some biology students are here, like if you are applying for the like stem cell biology, there is a position in the cell stem cell biology. So at least you should have an experience in stem cell biology to apply for that product, for, uh, sorry, for, the, for that particular project. Or you should have some expertise in the relevant techniques that that lab is using. For example, if some lab is using the confocal microscopy or super resolution microscopy, at least you should have that expertise in that field so that your application is uh, will get shortlisted. So the last thing that you will need to have in your application is like after it is a, it's just a post uh, selection. If you'll be selected for the position, you will need to have you will need to apply for the resident residence permit in a country that you will be completing the project. So the three most important part is one is the academic qualification. Another is your research experience will be most important, and then the residence permit. Thank you. So, yeah, Rashmi. Thank you. I'll take that up for the social sciences. As I said in my previous slide, uh, social sciences and humanities are fields that the YASI is now increasingly funding in. And I'm a social science student myself. And even though my field is technically geography, it's more critical geography that has to do with anthropology and politics. So, you know, as Akhil said, it's the same, you know, the eligibility criteria. Um, often vary depending on the project you are applying to and uh, the team might have their different sets of uh, interests and engagements and focal areas and you it is you know they will have their desired qualities in and the required qualities of the candidate you the first thing to do is to go through the research project website or the pro proposal very very carefully and yes a master's degree is a must a master's or equivalent that's the minimum requirement but a lot of projects might want you to have experience in some sort of you know engagement with the field that you are trying to apply to and uh, it would be nice to display some research capacity that is not always mandatory but that might be a desired experience so if you have a particular field of research you know we would suggest you engage more into it at least with the secondary literature and you know attend workshops that you can put on your cv so that your cv looks more diverse and it stands out and it is just not a master's degree and if, so and because you know i'm talking about social sciences they i'll have to you know and because i've studied in ireland it's an english speaking country the ilts especially the ilts also some universities do accept TOEFL. the schools are very very important so they you for ilts i'm aware they usually have a cutoff point of 7 or something like that uh, but that also varies from university to university or from project to project so it um, it is very, very essential that you figure that out. ILTS, you know, for a lot of you, ILTS might require some practice and training because it's it has like different segments that you attend to and you have to attempt listening, talking, writing. So give some time thinking about your ILTS exam because in social sciences, your you know, language skills do become you know important and they come in handy uh, because you will also eventually have to write a proposal and that proposal a lot depends on the English. And if you do not meet the cutoff point, the project might reject you. And if it's for other European countries, please remember to check if they have any other language criterion. It's not just, I mean, English is a requirement, but beyond that, you know, like in, and I know and for some projects in Germany, they do demand some basic skills in German. So remember to check that when you are looking for a scholarship. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I'll proceed with the application documents. Thank you, uh, Rashmi. So as you can see, the I'll be sharing with you the application documents that you will need to apply for the ERC or any application, particularly here we are talking about the ERC. So about the academic CV, as Rashmi said, it should be very diverse. So CV is like, it's the face, it's your face uh, for the reviewer. So academic CV is the most important thing here. So it should be, it should reflect each and everything about the project that you are applying to. It also depends on the project. It also depend, depends on the research experience that you have and the project that the project demands for. So it should include everything, your expertise, like the techniques you are expertise in, your relevant research experience, your awards, your your like uh, interpersonal skills. So this is one of the most important thing over here, CV. So it should be as strong as possible. So now the second important thing is the, it actually depends on the call or the application or the PI, what he wants, what he demands from you. So whether he wants a motivation letter, he wants a cover letter, he wants a statement of purpose. It depends on the PI, completely depends on the PI. So mostly in Europe, so you will need to submit at least motivation letter or the cover letter. Some may ask you for the statement of purpose or uh, another thing which is not written here, some may ask you for the project proposal before applying or before the interviews. It completely depends on them. So your motivation letters should reflect each and everything like what was your research experience, what you have done, why are you interested in a particular field? So why are you interested in my lab? So it should reflect each and everything. Then another part of the application, you need to uh, have like your degree certificates, master degree certificate and master transcripts. So here you need to take care of one thing. If your master's degree certificate or transcript is not, or not in the English language, then you need to translate them. For example, if you are applying for an ERC project, which are uh, like, which is uh, in like, for example, say Spain, if you have, if you are not having the transcripts or degree certificates in English, then you will need to translate them either in English or in Spanish. You need to check the website, you need to check the description of the degree certificates or transcripts. Or if you have already the transcripts in the English, then you don't need to worry about, you don't, You just need to uh, submit your documents. Then the last one, the another important thing, which is the recommendation letters. You will highlight, you'll need to highlight your uh, referees, for example, two or three, depending on the PI, depending on the project that how many they want. You will either need to uh, like, uh, mention them in your CV or in the application process. So now the important thing, the timeline. So basically, unfortunately, there's no specific timeline for the ERC funded projects. So it completely depends on the ERC grants. So we have mentioned here some grants, the five important grants, which ERC every year awards to the PIs, to the senior professors. So they are like ERC start grant, ERC consolidator grant, then advanced grant, proof of concept grant and the synergy grant. So we have like uh, mentioned the uh, month here that in 2024, when are, when these grants are to be awarded to the uh, PIs or the professors or whatever. So you need to check these grants when other results are going to come, because I'll tell you an example, for example, the ERC star grant. So if the PI, if any lab is awarded with the star, ERC star grant, so he'll at least as far as uh, I know, he's at least to get in 5 million euros for the next five years. So for that, he need to, he's definitely in need of like two or three or four PhD candidates or the postdocs. So he will need to hire like two or three candidates for this. So you need to take care of this thing. You need to like check the results of the each and every grant because after the grant has been awarded, they will definitely advertise these positions either on their website or on their social media or through the institution. So for the STEM applicants here, they will need to have they'll need to apply to the specific lab, uh, labs which are being awarded with these five ERC grants. So now, how can you find the positions? That's the most important thing because if you can, if you check the ERC website, they will not highlight, they will not advertise any of the PhD positions over there. It completely depends on the awardee that has been awarded the grant, whether he is going to like post it through the social media, Twitter handle, LinkedIn whether through like his own website or through the institution that is being awarded with the ERC grant. So like we have just for an example, we have uh, here give you a link that you can check on 
because we have already filtered that we have entered the year we have just uh, wrote the erc over there and you can find all the positions over there the erc granted positions whether in science in technology in mathematics in social science any anything over there so you can find the positions over here and then another thing the most important one the selection process how does it goes so as uh, rashmi also said the cv should be diverse it should reflect each and everything according to the project it doesn't mean that you have a cv which is far diverse from for like completely different from the project what project demands so you will not get shortlist that's that's it. it that's what it is it's very specific the program the research scholarship is very specific you need to have a research experience and expertise in a very in that particular field that's it so based on that you need to frame your cv you need to frame your motivation letter and in motivation letter you need to specifically like mention why are you interested in that particular lab i want to join why want you join the lab so completely so if you are short if your application gets shortlisted like for the second round or interview round then you are 25 percent done so the most important thing is your cv and the motivation letter you need to have very strong cv and motivation letter. now for example if you are shortlisted for another round now it completely also depends on again on the pi how he'll frame the interview whether he'll go for the single round whether he'll go for the multiple rounds it completely depends on him for example if he gets like 50 60 applicants then he wants to filter out some students. So he'll get like uh, out of 50, he'll take 20 students for the next round. Then out of 20, he'll want like only five or 10 students. Then he can have the preliminary interview. He can discuss uh, with you some things like your background. Is your CV relevant to our uh, like lab, our project? So he can ask you all these things. Then after the pre preliminary interview, if he thinks that you are suitable for the position, he may ask you for the final round interview. Again, here, it depends on the PI. He can also go for the single round of interview, then select you or whatever, but he can also go for the two or three rounds of interviews. And after the interview, if he thinks that you are suitable for the position, then he may ask you for the recommendation letters that you have already given the names or you have mentioned in your CV, the two or three, uh, your referees. But also here, you need to, man you need to uh, take care of this thing. It depends on the PI, it depends on the application, whether you have to submit your recommendation letters prior to your, like uh, before submitting the application or after the interviews, it completely depends on him. So like sometimes you will, uh, if you are applying to like US or somewhere else, so before like interviews, you need to submit your recommendation letters. But here it depends on him, whether it's like uh, you need to submit the recommendation letters before submitting the application or after the interview. So at the end, if you are selected, or if you are like, uh, if he uh, selects you for the particular position, he will offer you, he'll send you an offer letter or an appointment letter. Then after that, with this offer letter, you can then apply for the residence permit for that specific country that why you have to do your project. So I think I'll hand over now to Rashmi. Okay, so thank you, Akhil. That was very, very comprehensive and exhaustive at the same time, and you covered most of the things mm -hmm. that uh, is meant to be covered. But I will, you know, shift the focus a bit on social science because in social yeah. science, things work a little differently. And um, because science is more structured in STEM fields, it's more structured and, you know, people are used to working in groups in big labs and coming together. That does not happen in case of social science. Most social science PhDs that you will come across, you will see that they are working on their individual projects funded either by the university or by, you know, funding bodies. That is what always happens most of the time. But so a lot of people, you know, find it confounding or surprising that there are actually collaborative work present in social sciences and that you can come together as a team and work there. So the first and the most important thing for that is to network, you know, build your network. And I know it sounds a bit daunting when I say build your network. It sounds scary that how do I do it? I'm sitting in a different country. How do I build my network in a completely different country? Um, the first step to doing that is deciding on what you want to work on. That this is my identifying your area of research. So identify your area of research, you know, read the secondary literature, develop a source of a knowledge base on that area and then go online google will always be your best friend and find potential supervisors across universities write to them 
you have to keep knocking on all the doors. Not everyone may respond, but you can. You know, like go over there and keep telling them that, oh, this is what I want to work on. Do you have a research position open? It so might happen that they might have an individual research position open and you might get your individual funding. But once you let the world know, you know, you, people who are experts in your field and sitting in universities across Europe, they find out that this is what you're interested in. They will remember you and they will recommend you to people who have ERC grants, you know. Because at times what happens with the social sciences is they depend more on networking rather than going through the, you know, the route of advertising and finding someone because it's a very long route. And um, they prefer to have students who already come with recommendations. And so it is very, very important to let your work be known. Make sure you do that. So just talk to people, talk to as many people as you can. It can at times be disheartening and uh, some people will not respond, but some supervisor, like potential supervisors, some professors will be exceedingly kind to you and they will give you further feedback on your research proposal and they will further strengthen your research. And that is how you have you know, you get through it. So make sure you get the word out. Do not just, you know, keep it to yourself and keep looking for positions. Talk to people. That will be your network. They will support you. Even after you get your PhD, you know, if you get, suppose you are accepted in a particular project and you know what to do. So this project usually will be related to what you are interested in. And like, I'll give you my example. I was always in, interested in political behavior and informal labor in the context of India. And then, you know, when I started looking for PhD, I spoke to hundreds of people across, you know, in the UK and as well as Europe. And that is how I found out about the particular project that I'm working in, which works on a very, very similar field. So this is how things also happen. So remember to get the word out. Do not be shy. Just talk to people, write to them and believe in yourself that you, you are good enough to do that. And also the cornerstone of an ESC project is group work. And as Akhil was talking about it, the lab is the fundamental part of what you're doing. And while it's very acceptable in STEM, because you all, you know what a lab entails in STEM, in social science, a lab is more ill-defined, it's more vague, but it's your co-working space. You will have people coming from different projects, you know, two or three PhD. And you have to keep in mind that it is collaborative. You are not competing with them over there. So all of you together are, you know, you are part of the knowledge production process. You are coming together. You are working as a team. So you will do your individual research. So you will also be focusing on collaborations. And by the end of your research, you will have collaborative articles as well as individual pieces. So remember when you are writing your CV, when you are highlighting your research area, also remember to talk about your team building experience, like teamwork. If you have some prior job experience, that's excellent. You can, you know, excellent that you can talk about teamwork in that case. In case you don't and you are fresh out of masters, talk about highlight experiences where you had to have, you know, teamwork done because that will make your CV stand out because most ERC principal investigators in social sciences that have met, they, you know, hop on that teamwork. And uh, yes, as, as I keep saying, you know, keep uh, focusing on the secondary literature, read a bit. When you talk to people, display that knowledge that you are aware of what you want to do and you are aware of the research that's happening in your field. And you are aware of, you know, the gap in literature that you would want to focus on. It does not have to be absolute. It does not have to be really, really strong. You know, you are just starting out. They will not expect a really high standard out of you, but they would want you to know that you are motivated enough to research. And so display that motivation anytime you approach any potential supervisor or any principal investigator. I think, yeah, that's about it. And uh, these are very important things for. Uh, yeah, Rashmi, I'll just add. It's a yeah, great sure. thing you Thank said you. that uh, about the teamwork, that uh, mm -hmm. most PIs, they prefer the teamwork over here. And mm -hmm. what, I'll, uh, what I also experienced from my PI, what uh, he said that I just... Uh, he said that most of the candidates, they wrote something on the CV and they don't know about that thing. So that's the most important thing. If you are writing anything about the CV, anything on the CV, sorry, anything on the CV, you should know each and everything about that. I'll just uh, give my example. When I was interviewed by the interviewer, 
So there was a panel interview and I don't think there was a single thing on the CV that they didn't ask me, each and everything they asked me. So he said that when I interviewed like a lot of candidates, they were writing on the CV, but they did, didn't know about that thing. So you need to be very specific. Don't worry if you are if you don't have so much of experience or so much of expertise, but write only thing that you know, that you can defend over there. That's the positive thing about the application. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rashmi and Keel, for such a um, comprehensive presentation and for sort of speaking to everyone about the procedures and, and how to apply for the ERC grant. Uh, now we move to the Q&A part of, of the workshop. So if anyone has any questions, you can raise your hand and ask your question or you can put your question in chat, whatever uh, you prefer. And then we can put your question to the speakers. So any question about um, the ERC grant? Yes, Aisha, go ahead. Hi. Uh, so I was just going to the website uh, for the ERC. And I was looking into um, various grants. And uh, under the heading of who can apply for starting grant, it says researchers of any nationality with two to seven years of experience since completion of PhD, etc., etc., etc. So I just want to understand it since completion of PhD. What does that mean? Am I reading it wrong? Or uh, my, what I'm understanding is after you complete your PhD is what they're trying to say. Yeah. So will you take it up again? Or yeah, again, uh, just yeah, so yeah. the. So the grants I have mentioned, it's for the, that's what I said. These grants are awarded to the PIs, not you. Because there is no specific timeline over there that uh, they'll just say that uh, the PSD positions are open for the ERC funded position. So yeah. these grants are for the PIs. So when PIs are granted, uh, awarded with these grants, then you can approach them for the PSD positions. So these are not for you. These are just an example when you can have a look when are the awards are granted. These are grants are awarded to the specific PIs, not for the PSD candidates. These are for the PIs only, all the grants. Yeah, once Got the it. PI yeah. get a grant, you know, once the PI gets the grant, then they will open up positions. Depending on how much fund they're getting, they will have positions for accepting two or three or four PhDs or and postdoc positions. So once the PI has that consolidated grant, they will then open the call for you know PhD applications, and that's where you come in, and that's where you can start applying depending on your research interest. If the PI has a research interest in your area and he's working on a project that you are interested in, you can approach them and then take it from there. Is that clear? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. That that was helpful. Thank you. Well. There's one question that came to my uh, DM, uh, which is that uh, is uh, IELTS a requirement even in STEM applications, IELTS or TOEFL, like the English language test? Yeah, exactly. and, uh, and secondly, is there a possibility of getting a waiver on the test? Okay. So, yeah, I would have mentioned, I, I should have mentioned in the eligibility criteria. So it completely depends on the institution then. For example, ERC is awarded to the uh, specific PIs, okay, but not to the like institutions. So like most of the, not most of the, you know, some universities, what they do in the, the English proficiency test, so they'll say if you are like, if you have a degree or certificate from specific countries, then you don't need to have the specific test. For example, I am here in Helsinki. So there was a one specific criteria I need to submit the IELTS or some TOEFL scores or whatever. But there was, they have just updated this thing this year that if you have a degree from a specific country, then you don't, you just need to show us that it's mentioned on the transcript that your instructions for were in English. So that's, that's some, but most of the, yeah, most of the universities are most of the institutions in STEM. So they will need, they will require, uh, English proficiency test, like Rashmi said, that's the thing. But also it depends on the institution. 
Uh, and as for the waiver, it, it's it, as Akhil said, it does depend on the institution. They might accept if your medium of instruction, your previous medium of instruction was entirely in English, as that happens often in India, they might agree to that, but they it depends on the PI and the institution, but that might not happen. It, they will only accept degrees like for me personally, for my PhD, I didn't have to sit for an Altius, but that's because my mas one of my masters is from the UK. So they accepted the UK degree, but they wouldn't have accepted any other degree. So keep that in mind. A waiver might always not be the case. So, you know, the, and in STEM field, the requirement might be lower. I am not aware of that, but in social sciences, it is very important. Yeah, I'll recommend you to sit for the test and yeah, yeah. it's better. It's better to prepare it, for the test better. and have an, yeah. It's also for your, you know, experience exactly. and uh, um, knowing where you stand because you will have to keep on working in English for the next few years. And after that, if you continue being in academia. Yeah, um, there's a question in chat. Um, is So we linked, uh, um, we linked in the PPT where you can find <clears throat> PhD opportunities. Is that the only resource? And uh, uh, I mean, you can find social sciences uh, opportunities there as well. But are there other places where you can find uh, these PhD opportunities? Mm, is it for social science? Um. Uh, this is something Akhil was talking about. It's the same for social sciences. You know, you have to, it depends completely on the principal investigator. It depends on, you know, they might give out the call on X, like asked while Twitter, and you might find it from there. The call might be on LinkedIn and you might find it from there. Or the call, they might, it might be on accounts. Like, I don't know if, you know, here you have something like job profiles, like Indeed and all, they might just give it out over there. Like for the UK, you have something like jobs.se.uk, but that doesn't work for Europe. They might have something like that. But as I kept on saying, there is no one particular website or social media where you can get it. And that is where the importance of networking comes in. Talk to people so that people are aware. And then the more people you talk to, the more aware you will be of such grants being granted. And people like experts in your research area getting those grants and where that you can be part of. So begin networking like today. That is the most important thing. Talk to people, find out you know what you want to work on. It sounds daunting, but once you get into the process, it really is not. It is just a process. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Azhar, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Hello. Uh, thanks for the second one. So my question is, like, uh, I have started my bachelor's in, in biological science, that is the biotechnology. Then I, I did master's in inaugural science. Now I feel like I wish to get into the biotech itself. Like, can I, uh, do, it means that do I need to go with an, another master's in biotech or can I, uh, with this two uh, degree, is, this, is it enough to directly go to the PhD? Like, and yeah. So, uh, sorry, Asar, uh, your master's is it? Uh, you have done master's in? Inaugural science, in inaugural science. Okay. So basically, as long as you have the experience in the relevant field, it doesn't matter whether you have a master's in biochemistry, botany, zoology, environmental science, anything. As long as you have the relevant experience in that particular field, for example, if you want to go to the cancer biology or neuroscience, as long as you have the particular experience, don't worry about it. You can directly apply for the PhD for a particular okay. project. Yeah. So for that, yes. what, you, what you can do, for example, if you have completed the master's and if you want to go to the cancer biology or neuroscience, you can have a little experience before uh, applying to the PhD in that relevant field so that it can help you for, uh, for getting selected in that particular position. So got it. And, and one more thing, like for this uh, uh, funding, like ERC funding, there are many fundings like available all over the world. So like it is, is it specifically that uh, the PI will look for the age bars for the students? Like, is there an age bar for the student to apply for this particular course? No, no, right? no, 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 no. Take me an example. Don't worry about it. Me too. Me too. <laughs> There's no age bar here. Absolutely none. 
All right. So uh, it is there is no age bar for getting to the PhD. I, I, okay, I no. get it. But uh, is there any age bar like moving forward doing the postdoc or in the jumping to the industrial career? As long no. as as long as you are interested in doing science, don't worry about the age. You can start your PhD even at thirty five or forty. Don't worry at all. I did. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. There's another question that has come to my DM. Uh, so I'm just going to read it out. Um, I've already uh, found two. Uh, I've already found four supervisors across Europe who are ready to supervise my project. Last year, I applied for two grants, but failed. Um, this year again, I applied for two fundings under two supervisors. Um, so is there a possibility that I can ask my supervisor to apply for the grant with my project if he is interested in the grant? No, uh, um, while we say it's collaborative, I don't think it would work that way uh, because the supervisor would need more, I mean, in interest, motivation themselves. And uh, they would also need more resources for themselves to be able to apply to the grant. So if they're not interested in the grant, um, like for postdoc, that often happens that you can, you know, come together and apply for a collaborative grant for a lot of grant that works. But for PhD, I don't think that is a possibility. But I would also add that please do not be disheartened just because you are rejected by, you know, one or two places. Like rejection is the foundation stone of your PhD application, you will be rejected like from zillions of places. And those rejections build your, you know, your proposal, they build your knowledge base and those rejections do come in handy, trust me, you know. And uh, also according to, a, like Azara had asked about age, age doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. I was a journalist before I moved back to academia and uh, with years of experience. So I'm a very, very senior candidate and uh, as long as you're willing to work hard put in that effort know that there's no shortcut it's all good and also and it's the same with rejection you will have rejection you will not get it the year you start applying it will require a few years it might i'm not saying it definitely will it might and that is perfectly okay yeah i, I agree with uh, rashmi like uh, she said that don't get this out and this is the most important thing that you'll get rejections for example, everywhere, but you need to keep applying, you need to keep a card, and you need to have the hope. That's the most important thing. Don't get disheartened. You need to keep applying. Rejection is a part of your part of the PhD application. Uh, whoever asked, yeah, sorry, Rashmi, no, no, no. Someone had raised their hand over there, Imba. Yeah, I'm. Go. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yeah. I'm com I actually completed my master's in chemistry. Uh, currently, I don't have any questions in ERC. I have a question regarding the Mary Curie fellowship. In that one, and there is a thing called John PhD, where uh, two years of the PhD is from one university, and also one year of the PhD is from another university. It is called some John PhD. Is it okay to get the John PhD degree? Uh, do you know anything about Mary Curie fellowship? I mean, I know very basic things, but no, no idea. Should be fine. No idea. Sorry, uh, it was not clear to me. Actually, it was the voice was breaking. I think they're asking about the Marie Curie uh, scholarship that's given in Europe. I don't know if it's across Europe or if it's just in. Uh, uh, it's well, Europe does have Marie Curie. Um, yeah. uh, but their scholarship structure is completely different. It's not like, I mean, I do not have much knowledge of it. But it should be okay. I mean, it should be fine. Yeah. Uh, even uh, about the Marie Curie, uh, I'll tell you like there are some institutions which are which like for example they open the call for the PhD positions. Yeah. There are like for example they have fourteen positions. So out of fourteen positions, they may they may say that or they may advertise that a couple of positions are Marie Curie positions. That's what I know about is because there was one of the uh, there's one of the institutions in Spain Barcelona. It's called the Institute of Research in Biomedicine. So every year they like uh, open the call for like PhD positions seven, eight, ten, fourteen depends on the positions they have. Then out of those ten or twelve positions, there are like a couple of positions they mentioned that they are for the Marie Curie. So it would be maybe like that, I guess. I don't exactly know what the thing. We will conduct a session on the Marie Curie's fellowship, I think it's called. Oh, a it's really 
yeah <laughs> there's a question in chat uh, about your home uh, cities and countries uh, on island and helsinki are they hospitable countries for a long journey like a phd uh, um okay i'll i'll take this up and then i will um akil can talk about helsinki because i have no idea about helsinki um ireland is a lovely country yes it's very friendly and they are they are as you say hospitable the people are lovely and but having said that if you are leaving your home country for the first time and you are moving you know to another country so um, it will require a lot of uh, you know, adjustment, and you will also have to be aware of the visa procedure. Um, Akil did speak about the residence permit. The visa procedure comes before that, and uh, you know, as Indians, we do require study visas to almost every country, and that is a long drawn procedure. But after you are accepted, you know, to your project, to, after you accepted your PhD, whatever, and this applies to any PhD that you want to apply to. And, um, you know, the visa procedure can be a bit tedious, but, you know, Ireland is a beautiful country. It's a lovely country. The people are friendly and um, I personally love it over here. Um, I've lived in both the UK and Ireland, but I also found UK quite friendly. I think, you know, being part of a student community is a privilege. So no matter where you go, I think it's a privilege, no matter how old you are, no matter, you know, what your previous experiences are, no matter where you come from because it's not just the country you will have peers colleagues friends you know from across the globe and you will come together in my lab i work with my supervisor is from brazil i work with other people from brazil from the philippines my uh, closest friends in the uni in my school you know one of them is chinese and so it's so and one of them is ecuadorian and it's it's so diverse it is that diverse experience that makes you who you are and it is an integral part of uh, the phd journey and i'm sure that's the case with all countries that you know people from across the world come together and you are working you have similar research interests of so you learn from them you know they are there to support you and even if it's not similar you will have areas where you struggle and they will be stronger in those areas and they'll come together and so, yes, I I think uh, all countries are hospitable that way because all student communities are hospitable. We are not working nine to five jobs. We are not corporate workers. We are students. And it doesn't matter how old we are. We will always be students and part of the academic community, which I think, you know, I have reasons to think positively about too. And then, uh, Akhil, what about Helsinki? Yeah, so as uh, Rashmi said, I agree that the diversity is the most important thing in a lab. Okay, you will have like one from the Middle East, one from the West, one from the Asia, everywhere. So it's the most important thing for the lab, for your development, for each and everything. That's how the lab works. So as far as the Finland is concerned, that you might have already like seen the happiest country in the world. Why? Because of the so everything is soft here. The work is so soft, so smooth that you won't find it like you are doing a PhD work here. Literally, because as we, like I have done a research experience in India. So what's our habit that we stay in the lab for the whole day, for the whole night, even for like 12 hours or 13 hours. That's not in the case in the like Finland or other European countries, I believe. So like you won't take it as a PhD student. It's like a job yeah, and you go that your PI has given you some work, you have done it and that's it. That's it. Whether you will work for the two hours or you will work for four hours, five hours, six hours, nobody is going to tell you here. And the weekends, you don't need to come here at all. You don't need to. That's it. So the best thing is that the, your mindset, your mentality, you don't get pressurized each and everything, in the, at least in the PhD, because you are a researcher, you are going to be an independent scientist. So Helsinki is by far, I think, one of the best in this case, because I think for every two months, your PI will ask you if you have any problem, if you have any, if you have any problem, if you are su suffering from something. They, they are going to like take a feedback from you if you need anything, if you need, if you are facing any problems in settling or whatever. And yeah, it's very hard. Like Rashmi said that when you are going to come, when you are coming out first time from the India to any other countries, it's very hard to get settled. That's what happens with everyone. If uh, like when you are coming for the first time. So it takes time for to settle down over here. But as time passes, you get settled. There's no problem at all. 
And I think Europe is one of the, UK and Europe is one of the best for doing the PhD. As far Absolutely. as I have experienced so far. Absolutely. No, I completely yeah. agree with that. UK and Europe are the best places for your PhD. Absolutely. Yeah. The people in the US might disagree. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, US is a very long drawn process, yeah. so it might not be for everyone. I think this is more comprehensive and this is for people. And yeah, about the about the visas, trust me, it's like a two days process for like in Finland. You go and you, you get a lot, a lot of respect that you are applying for the research visa. It's like a two day, pro within two days, your visa, your resident permit is done. That's it. And you don't need to wait over there in the visa application process. That's That was the smoothest thing I have ever experienced. Uh, that might not be the case with Ireland, though. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's not the case with Ireland because Ireland has <laughs> become a very popular academic and work destination for Indians. No, so no. the visa takes time. It is a very tedious procedure. You will require, um, you know, police verification certificates and everything. But but it gets done. It's just paperwork. It's just bureaucratic red tapism that you can eventually sail through. Yeah. So be prepared for it, but do not lose your heart. It's nothing complicated. It's just tedious. You have to keep doing it. That's that's it, you know. And uh, they, uh, as long as you have a valid letter uh, of acceptance, your offer letter, your scholarship letter, nothing will stop you from getting your, you know, fund like your visa. Sorry. Um, I received another question on DM, which is uh, about the stipend. Is it uniform across ERC grants or it depends on? I think it depends. Okay. So, yeah, it depends on, it's not like a fixed term. No, it depends on the institution. It depends on the country. For example, Switzerland is the, one of the most expensive countries in the world. Okay. So the average salary, if you see the stipend over there, it's like it might be 3,000 3, plus because it's very expensive. That might not be the case in the Helsinki or in the Spain or in the UK. So it completely depends on the country. But having said that, yes, absolutely. But having said that, ERC usually pays more than other grants. Yeah, it is. So you because it's one of the prestigious. Grants, yeah, it pays more than other grants. At least in Ireland, the university grants are far less than what ERC pays a stipend. So... And plus, you will always have extra money for field work. And ERC is generous. Let's just say ERC is quite generous that way. So m your stipend or, you know, sustaining yourself will not be an issue. And uh, one more thing, for example, if the grant is for the four, if your PhD is for the four years, okay, then because most of the PhD programs in the Europe is four years. So you'll be having funding for the four years. But as Rashmi said, it's so generous that you can go up to like 4.5 or 5 years. They can like easily fund you. Depends obviously on the PI, but yeah, it, they can go smooth. Uh, there's a question on social science. Um, the question is for social sciences, is it difficult to get in a PhD if you're a non-UK master's? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. No, no, no. It doesn't matter. You see, before, uh, as I was saying for myself, um, one of my master, I had a master's in India as well, and I was working as a journalist for a very long time. Then I wanted to move back into academia, and I wasn't confident that I, after all these years of working as a journalist, that I would be a good fit for a PhD. I wanted, a, you know, a base in uh, um, another master's in the UK. So I, I, go, and I, I was lucky enough to get scholarships. So I went there and I did my school master's and then I came, you know, moved to my PhD also after a while. So no, absolutely not. As long as you display, you know, enough uh, research acumen, it's perfectly fine. You don't need to have a UK master's. I do have one and uh, I also, you know, like I have my relevant research experiences also in the UK because I've worked as research assistants over there, but it is not mandatory. Uh, like uh, my other colleagues who work with me, they have the, their masters from their respective countries, the Philippines and Brazil. And so obviously, and there are people I know in our land who have just finished their masters in India and moved to you know, getting funding and um, whatever funding it is. So no, that is, you don't have to worry about it at all. I think there's a question uh, for you, Akhil and Chad. Yeah. I didn't so, know. Uh, this is uh, how did I, okay, I'm taking biotechnology, can I apply for the MD or PhD? So yeah, as far as the PhD, uh, sorry, MD is concerned, I think, 
what uh, I believe for MD, the eligibility should be that you should have MBBS, I guess, to so get uh, like uh, to like get into the MD program. So I believe this. I don't know, but I think for MD, you need to have the MBBS program. So for PhD, there's no problem. You would, you can have MTech in biotechnology. You can have MSc in biotechnology, there is no problem at all. If even if you have a BSc or like a bachelor's degree for like if you have BTech, which is for four year program, they can also like consider that thing. But for MD, you need to have the MBBS pro. You need to have the MBBS. That's that's the important thing, I guess. I'm just gonna take Rahul's question. Um, Rahul, we have actually already conducted a workshop on drafting your CV. Um, and we also have a very comprehensive guide on writing your CV. So I'm just gonna link the two of them. Uh, you can find them on uh, the website of Project Edu Access. Uh, and hopefully that should help you. Uh, yes, Mugaram, go ahead. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so I want to know if we are applying to Finland, uh, do we have a graduate structured graduate program? Or let's say we have to mail an API and uh, then after, let's say, few rounds of interview. So, I mean, how what's the process? So you can always mail an API in Finland. That's how the PhD works over here. Before even applying to the graduate program for the particular university, like University of Helsinki, Alto University, or any top university, you need to get in touch with the PI. That's it. If he's ready to accept you as a PhD student through his grant or her grant or whatever, or university like funded applications, then it becomes very easy for you. So in the interview, in the application process, it becomes very easy for you. But the important thing is that he need to accept you as a PhD student. So this depends on your application again, your CV, your motivation letter, or your interaction with him or her. Depends on that. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. I mean, we're also right at the end of the hour. So if anyone has any questions now would be the time to ask or if there's any question that's that was put in chat but has been unanswered please put it up again um you can also send it to me via dm if if you feel more comfortable doing that but okay it seems like that's about it um Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. I am just putting a link to our YouTube channel, which is where the uh, recording of this workshop will be uploaded. So in case you joined in late or you missed a certain section, you can uh, you can sort of have a uh, look at the recording. Uh, and we'll also upload the PPT that we use. So you can have a look at that as well, just in case you weren't able to follow during the presentation. Um, and I've also linked, I've sent the link to the uh, page that uh, Akhil had spoken about where you can find PhD opportunities. Uh, but once you have the PPT, you'll also see it hyperlinked there. So you can just have a look there. And uh, and I've also linked uh, a recording of a workshop that we did on drafting our CV. And uh, we've also, uh, I've also put in chat the link to all of the guides that we've developed at Project Edu Access on writing our university documents, so whether it's your personal statement, statement of purpose, CV, uh, research proposal. Um, and if anyone has any doubts and you are not a mentee at Project Edu Access, please feel free to reach out to us. Rahul, I've, I'm putting an email ID in chat. Please reach out to us on this email ID, info at projecteduaccess.com and we will respond to your um, questions. Uh, okay, so that's a quick question by Aisha. We, uh, we apply to the options, we apply for the PhDs ourselves. Yes. Uh, Rashmi, Akhil. We uh, apply to the opportunities, opportunities as we apply. Yes, the yes, it's the same way. Like individual funding, you have to apply the same way. I mean, 
uh, at least for social sciences is the same i don't and the it's same, for, it's it's same for each and every you find yeah. the opportunity you approach the principal investigator yes yeah and for the erc the application is the phd application so it's that you'd be applying for a phd separately um, but so for... if uh, just an uh, add on here because i think uh, most recently i don't remember the grant name but recently some erc grant has been awarded to the pis i think two grants one is a start grant and another one is i don't know the second one proof of concept or the consolidator but they can also have a look if uh, their pis or their interest they have been awarded because it's just they upload the file who are who are awarded with the erc grant they can look at it it's just a 2023 but the 2024 we have already mentioned in the ppt that when our results going to come tentative amazing thank you so much rashmi and akil for taking the time out and speaking to everybody about erc grants and scholarships i'm sure it helped many people and everyone who's going to see the recording as well okay. uh, thank you so much to everyone who joined us today i hope you all have a nice rest of the weekend and uh and i'll see the mentees later today for another workshop but uh, see you all. Thank you so much once again, Rashmi and Akhil. Thank you, Ms. Well, yeah, thank you, Ms. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Well. It was a lovely one. Yeah, yeah it was a wonderful experience. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.